Okay, hello and welcome back everyone to Grocket.com's OGTV. This is the GMAT edition once again. My name's Jim Jacobson, like it says right up there. And we are going through the official guide to the test, question by question, cover to cover, um, in this program. <clears throat> As opposed to programs where we either do a different test or we go through the questions that actually appear in Grocket itself. Uh, this is the 50th broadcast of this particular program, so welcome those of you who may or may not have been with us uh, since the beginning. And we are in the middle of the reading comprehension section. Actually, it's really more towards the end of the reading comprehension section. We're on page 400, and we're on question number 115. So this, this broadcast does uh, require you, to, in order to get the most out of this, actually for the reading comprehension, in order to really get anything out of it, you do need to have the official guide in front of you, um, because I'm not going to read the entire reading comprehension passage to you, and even if I did, that really wouldn't test your reading comprehension, that would test your listening comprehension. So um, you do need to have the book in front of you. I will be taking notes on the passage while and reading it while you also read it, and then we'll go over the questions together. We'll go through two passages today, and then actually I think next time, which will be next week because I'm going to take the weekend off, um, we will go through the remaining two passages and then we are done with reading comprehension. So this is basically the end of that section. And I guess the other things I'll say... Yeah, I don't think I really have anything else to say about that right now. So I think there's no good reason not to get started now. So um, I'll mark down that we started at 03. And uh, so about four minutes to read the passage, and then we'll start talking, I mean.
Okay, let's stop there and tackle these questions. Again, I took some notes, and as always, I made them a little bit more thorough because you're going to have them on your screen and you're going to be reading them. Um, when you take your own notes, and of course when I take my own notes just for my own use, I don't write quite as many words. I abbreviate a lot more. Um, I don't use prepositions like of. I probably would have written rotational vel um, galaxies or something like that. Um, so just keep in mind that this is not purely modeling what I would do. It's uh, partially done for your benefit. And of course, the fact that I'm talking out loud is entirely for your benefit. Um, on the real GMAT, uh, you get in trouble if you sit there and explain what's going on in the passage uh, verbally. So um, anyway, again, uh, it's always a good idea after you've read the passage to kind of summarize what you think the main idea is and whether the author has an opinion. So basically the whole thing is about um, the amount of mass and matter out there in the universe and how a lot of it, it seems like a lot of it probably isn't um, stuff that generates light. And uh, is the author trying to convince us of something or persuade us of a particular course of action? No, uh, this is basically an explanatory passage. So um, that helps us to eliminate some wrong answer choices sometimes. Let's take a look at those questions. All right, so number 115. Uh, the passage is primarily concerned with A, defending a controversial approach. Um, you know, uh, this one's wrong for two reasons. One is actually that first word, defending. Uh, again, with a, in a passage where the author is defending something, the author is trying to convince you that something is right. And we already determined that the author is not actually trying to persuade us, and so defending makes it uh, problematic. And then also, there is no controversial approach. There's, there's no controversy, there's no argument, um, just some data and some observations and some theories. So definitely not choice A. Uh, choice B, criticizing an accepted view. And uh, I guess criticizing could be in a descriptive passage, but um, we don't really have an accepted view and there really isn't a criticism, so not B. Uh, C, summarizing research findings. That sounds pretty good. They have this research uh, on rotational velocity of galaxies. So, you know, we'll keep C. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, D, contrasting competing theories. We don't have competing theories. We just kind of have the one. And E, describing an innovative technique. I suppose the analysis of looking at the rotational velocity of spiral galaxies might be a technique. Um, but the how they do it isn't actually described. Um, I'm going to guess it involves telescopes or something, but uh, you know that's just a guess. It's not in the passage, so it's not E. That gives us answer choice C, uh, summarizing research findings for the correct answer. So number one sixteen. The author's study indicates that, in comparison with the outermost regions of a typical spiral galaxy, the region just outside the nucleus can be characterized as having. So the author's study, where do we find out about the author's study? That's basically in paragraph two. I didn't actually end up making a note about that. Um, and my pen has stopped working again. Well, we'll see if it starts up in a little bit, and while I continue to talk about question number 116. So it's in paragraph 2, um, and the outer stuff as opposed to the inner stuff, uh, the author describes how um, if uh, bodies or matter that gives off light, if matter that gives off light, luminous matter, were the only matter in a galaxy, the stuff going, um, the rotational velocity, um, and what are we talking about? Oh, the region just outside the nucleus. So the rotational velocity um, of the stuff further out would have been going faster. That's the note that I have there. Um, but it turns out that it's actually, that's not actually what's going on. So um, it suggests then that, uh, and, and the author actually says, um, Outside the nucleus, the rotational velocity would increase geometrically with distance from the center, center in conformity with Kepler's law. Instead, we have found that the rotational velocity in spiral galaxies either remains constant with increasing distance from the center or increases slightly. So um, 
the implication there is that in a lot of these spiral galaxies, the distance and the velocity, or as distance increases, velocity stays about the same. So, come on, please start working. I need to. Sorry, talking to my pen. Um, rotational velocity is probably kind of similar. And looking down the answer choices, we have um, different rotational velocities mentioned. Higher ro rotational velocity is in A, lower rotational velocity is in B and C, and D and E have similar rotational velocity. And remember, with this particular question, we're talking about the, um, the, the answer choices are meant to describe the region just outside the nucleus, which um, if the expected model, where, where luminous matter is the only stuff that's out there, uh, the stuff closest to the center would be moving the slowest, and the stuff um, out on the edges would be moving faster. It turns out it's all moving about the same, and so that basically eliminates choices A, B, and C. Uh, I'll use the mouse pad to get rid of these while I wait for the computer to recognize that I have the pen plugged in. Um, a, B, and C all give r different rotational velocities for um, the center and then the edges of a spiral galaxy, whereas the passage indicates that they're similar. Now we have to decide between D and E. Similar rotation velocity and higher luminosity, or similar rotational velocity and similar luminosity. Um, we do find out that um, it has been known for some time that outside the bright nucleus of a typical spiral galaxy, luminosity falls off rapidly with distance from the center. So spiral galaxies, brighter at the center than at the edges. Therefore, um, the center and the edges would not have similar luminosity. It's brighter in the middle than it is on the edges. That allows us to eliminate answer choice E and select then answer choice D. The stuff in the middle has a similar rotational velocity from the stuff on the edge, but higher luminosity because there's more bright stuff in the middle of the galaxy. And try plugging it in again. OK. Oh, and it's still not working. Hmm. Good times. OK. Well, we shall move on, and I'll keep working on it while I talk to you guys. Now it's just going to take me a little bit longer to do the erasing, because my fingers are not as fast as the pen. So we are on, oh, we've changed pages. We are now on page 401. Hang on, I want to try one more time, because I really, really want the pen to work. OK, all right, that's working. So page 401, <laughs> it stopped again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, those of you who got up early or stayed up late to watch this. OK, come on. OK, well, we'll just go this way. 401, uh, question number 118. Oh, dear, an 8. Well, that's as good as it's going to get. Uh, number 118, it can be inferred from information presented in the passage that if the density of the universe were equivalent to significantly less than three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter, which of the following would be true as a consequence? Where did we find out about three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter? That was back in the first paragraph. That was the amount of uh, density in the universe that would be required, uh, the, that's the sort of critical mass to stop the universe from expanding, kind of put the brakes on. And so uh, we can infer from the passage that if um, the density were less, that the universe wouldn't stop expanding. So let's look for that in the answer choices. Choice A, luminosity would be a true indicator of mass. Well, that's not necessarily true. That, that could actually be, be kind of a tempting answer choice because um, right now it seems like the only way that the universe could approach the appropriate density is through the presence of dark matter. You know, the stuff that just doesn't give off light. It's like planets and black holes and stuff. 
Um, but it could approach that with some dark matter, um, and then luminosity would not be a true indicator of mass. It just, we'd have dark matter, just not enough to stop the universe from expanding. Uh, choice B, different regions in spiral galaxies would rotate at the same velocity. That's a completely different topic. That's about uh, dark matter within galaxies and has nothing to do with the expansion of the universe. Choice C, the universe would continue to expand indefinitely. That is exactly what we predicted. We can pretty confidently mark that as the right answer, but let's just show how the wrong answer choices are constructed. Uh, D, the density of the invisible matter in the universe would have to be more than 70 times the density of the luminous matter. Um, Well, and so far, that's so that one uh, could be true, but it wouldn't have to be more than that. Um, it's not a logical consequence because we don't actually know that the universe has stopped. Um, that would be a logical consequence if we knew that the universe had stopped expanding and the density of the universe were less than three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. Um, but choice D is probably the most tempting of the wrong answer choices. Um, the density of the invisible matter would have to be a lot more to stop the universe, but that's not necessarily um, a consequence of having less than three hydrogen atoms per cubic meter. So it's not choice D. And choice E, more of the invisible matter in spiral galaxies would have to be located in their nuclei than in their outer regions. That is an irrelevant distinction and not helping us. So therefore it is what we originally thought Choice C, that uh, three hydrogen per cubic meter, was all about the universe's expansion. And I erase these. And I'll play with getting the pen working again during the next passage. While you read it, and I furiously try to get this to start working again. All right, so question 119. One. One. Circles are the hard part. 119. I realize the writing looks like I'm five years old. Okay, the authors propose all of the following as possibly contributing to the missing matter in spiral galaxies, except where do we find out about the missing matter? Um, what it might be, that's actually paragraph three, that's um, what we identified here. And they identified, um, so the universe is up to 90% dark matter, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, dim stars, planets, and black holes. So we need to find the answer choice that is not one of those three. Now, of course, there are five answer choices, so they'll probably have been somewhat creative. Let's see what we get. Uh, choice A, massive black holes. Um, well, it does mention black holes, uh, either small or massive, in lines uh, 39 and 40. <clears throat> so that allows us to eliminate answer choices A and B. B is small black holes. They're both mentioned in lines 39 to 40, which accounts for our two answer choices out of one thing from my notes. Uh, choice C, small dim stars. Dim stars were another one of the things mentioned. <clears throat> Uh, D, massive stars. We don't actually find out about massive stars. Um, it does say dark matter could be in the form of extremely dark stars or extremely dim stars or low mass. Uh, oh, dim stars of low mass. If they're massive, they're much more likely to be bright and therefore would be the luminous matter that gives off light. That's what luminous means, is giving off light. Um, so choice D, massive stars, really does sound like something that they didn't mention. And then choice E, large planets. And it does actually say in line 39, large planets like Jupiter. So all the other ones are mentioned, dim stars, planets, and then black holes of various sizes. So only choice D, the massive stars, um, are not mentioned as sources of dark matter, or missing matter, as the question phrases it. OK, so um, pen still not working. We shall move on to the next passage. Turn the page. We will be on page do this. So we are on page 402. Oh, 
sorry, it's just using the trackpad. 402, question number 120 and following. Not bad considering. Okay, so this is a long passage and I'd say relatively challenging. So I'll give you a little bit closer to, I mean, something like four and a half minutes. So um, starting now while I mess with the pen and take my own notes if I get the pen working. Oh, that's really much fun for me.
Okay, we can stop there. That was actually more like five minutes, but uh, lost track of time a little bit when I was uh, when I got the pen working. Okay, so question number one twenty. Oh, so first off, our view of the passage. Um, basically talking about these two different points of view as uh, technology and and uh, society interrelate. We have technological determinism and social constructivism. We get definitions of each of them in the course of the passage, and it's all kind of focused around this work of John Clark, um, who is a technological determinist, and how he did some work with uh, modernizing a telephone exchange. So, um, the author is not trying to convince us of anything. Uh, John Clark is, but uh, um, the author isn't, except perhaps that, uh, you know, it, it, does, it does suggest that the author perhaps sides with John Clark a little bit, but that we aren't being uh, encouraged to take any particular course of action. So, uh, number 120, the primary purpose of the passage is to... A, advocate a more positive attitude towards technological change. That word advocate right away sends up red flags for us. The author was not trying to get us to do any particular thing. Certainly not have a more positive attitude toward technological change. Uh, choice B, discuss the implications for employees of the modernization, um, the implications for employees of the modernization of a telephone exchange. We don't really have the implications for employees. I mean, we find out what happened um, to the organization when a particular telephone um, company uh, did actually uh, upgrade, but um, the primary purpose of the passage is definitely not to discuss those implications. They get mentioned, but not really in much detail. So I see, consider a successful challenge to the constructivist view of technological change. Um, uh, the, you know, the author, again, does seem to side with John Clark. At the very end, it says, thus Clark helps answer the question, when is social choice decisive and when are the concrete characteristics of technology more important? So uh, the author clearly um, does believe that uh, Clark's work adds something to the field and is successful. So um, I think we can we can at least keep this one. Uh, choice D, challenge the position of advocates of technological determinism. So it would actually be social constructivists who challenge the position of advocates of technological determinism, and the author um, definitely is not challenging advocates of technological determinism. The author is kind of explaining how one of them, namely John Clark, appears to have been successful. It's not choice D. Uh, choice E suggests that the social causes of technological change should be studied in real situations. Well, you know, you, you could potentially infer that, since uh, the fact that Clark uses both um, theoretical and empirical arguments, theoretical arguments are theoretical, empirical ones are based on actual observation, and that's where this real-life account of the technological change, this modernization of the phone exchange, that's where that comes in. And, you know, the author certainly does seem to believe that that was a good idea, that that really helps support John Clark's points. But it, it is going a little bit further to, A, say that the author believes that social constructivists should do the same, and B, that the whole passage was about that, because it really wasn't, so it's not E. So, choice E, consider a successful challenge to the constructivist view of technological change. That sounds like it. Choice C. I know you're all terribly curious, but I plugged the, uh, the tablet into a different USB port. That's why it's working now. So, you know, if you find troubles like this at home, try a different USB port. Question number 121. Which of the following statements about the modernization of the telephone exchange is supported by information in the passage? So where do we find out about the actual modernization of the telephone exchange? It gets mentioned in the first paragraph, but not in any detail. Um, the actual modernization thing appears in paragraph 4, where we find out that's our phone exchange example there. And so we need some, one of these statements needs to be supported by that information in paragraph four. We don't really need to go back and reread the whole paragraph until we see what the answer choices are. Um, a, 
the new technology reduced the role of managers in labor negotiations. We do find that management negotiated things with um, labor organizations. Uh, where was that? Some changes Clark attributes to the particular way management and labor unions negotiated the introduction of the technology. So, um, so that's where managers and labor unions get mentioned, but there's nothing about the role being reduced. So it's not A. Uh, B, the modernization was implemented without the consent of the employees directly affected by it. Again, that same passage where, where management was negotiating with labor unions. Um, labor unions are kind of consent by proxy. So while I guess you, it's possible that the labor unions went and negotiated something that employees really didn't want, um, it doesn't seem that likely, and it's certainly not supported by the passage since labor unions are specifically mentioned. It's not B. Uh, C, the modernization had an impact that went significantly beyond maintenance routines. Well, it does say that um, Clark shows how a change at the telephone exchange from maintenance-intensive electromechanical switches to semi-electronic switching systems altered work tasks, skills, training opportunities, administration, and organization of workers. That really does sound well beyond maintenance routines. So, um, gosh, C sounds awesome. I love it so much, but let's check the other ones. Choice D, some of the maintenance workers felt victimized by the new technology. Again, that actually does happen in real life when um, automated processes replace things that were done by hand, by human hands, but there's no support for that in the passage. There, nowhere does it say that um, anyone felt victimized. It's not D. And E, the modernization gave credence to the view of advocates of social constructivism. I think of the wrong answer choices, this one's somewhat tempting because um, the authors do actually, or the, the author says that Clark points out um, that some changes Clark attributes to the particular way management and labor unions negotiated the introduction of the technology. That would be the social constructivist approach, which is to say that people decide how technology gets um, created and implemented. So there is specific evidence for, um, you know, uh, the for advocates of uh, social constructivism, but um, that's not what the um, the primary thing was about. In fact, the um, the modern, it's, it's better supported that the modernization had an impact. It could also be, for example, you could use that, that, that same example of the labor unions and management to say that technology itself, the way the technology was created, forced labor unions and management to actually have that negotiation. So um, of the two, choice C is clearly the better one. Answer choice E is less well supported. Okay, number 122. Whoops. That is the worst two ever. 122. Which of the following most accurately describes Clark's opinion of Braverman's position? So Braverman doesn't get a lot of press in this passage. Braverman gets mentioned in paragraph two. And it looks like it's about the middle, just kind of scanning for Braverman's name. Um, Clark believes this possibility has been obscured by the recent sociological fashion exemplified by Braverman's analysis that emphasizes the way machinery reflects social choices. Um, and so Clark believes this possibility has been, ex been obscured. What possibility is that? It's the previous sentence. Put more strongly, technology can be a primary determinant of social and managerial organization. Okay, so Clark believes that Braverman's work does uh, obscures his own basically. So let's find that in the answer choices. Um, does Clark A respect Braverman's wide-ranging popularity? We don't find anything about wide-ranging popularity. We do find out that there is this sociological fashion, but we don't know anything about Braverman's work being widely popular. Uh, B, does Clark disapprove of its misplaced emphasis on the influence of managers? 
Well, I don't know. We, I guess we actually have to read further to see whether Braverman talks about managers. It says, for Braverman, the shape of a technological system is subordinate to the manager's desire to wrest control of the labor process from the workers. Wow. Well, um, that definitely sounds like uh, emphasis on the influence of the manager. So we will keep answer choice B and keep going. Uh, choice C, he admires the consideration it gives to the attitudes of the workers affected. Yeah, you know, um, workers don't really get mentioned except in the sentence that I just read where managers desire is to wrest control of the labor process from the workers. So I wouldn't say that that's a um, consideration to the attitudes of the workers affected at all. Um, D, he is concerned about its potential to impede the implementation of new technologies. So none of these people, um, technological determinists, social constructivists, John Clark, Braverman, none of them seem to be particularly for or against technological implementation or innovation. They're just talking about how it actually works, what, what drives it and what, what is driven by it. So um, I'm sure they care about it one way or the other, but we don't actually have that information. So not D. Uh, e, he is sympathetic to its concern about the impact of modern technology on workers. Well, um, no, I mean, you know, uh, he's not sympathetic to it. I mean, he's, he actually, again, views that this point of view, Braverman's point of view, obscures the role of technology in its ability to cause organizations to change just by the virtue of the way the technology is. So that gives us answer choice B is our correct one. And we are now able to move on to a new page, which I can write using the pen, and a new question. All right, so now page 403, hopefully that handwriting looks different, um, and question number 123. The information in the passage suggests that which of the following statements from hypothetical sociological studies of change in industry most clearly exemplifies the social constructivist's version of te technological determinism? Wow, that's a mouthful and a brainful. Let's kind of just break that question down a little bit. Which of the following, um, so the passage suggests, so we need to infer which answer choice sounds like um, what so social constructivists say about technological determinism. Where do we say, where do we find out about that? That's actually paragraph three, where remember the author says that social constructivists have gained ground by misrepresenting what technological determinism is. In case we need to refresh our memory because I didn't write it down in my notes. They uh, represent it uh, by saying that technology e exists outside society capable of directly influencing skills and work or work organization. That is to say, without people being involved. Whereas uh, John Clark, etc., say that it's a negotiation between people and technology, but technology is kind of uh, causing that to happen. Okay, so we need something like that in the answer choices. That's the misrepresentation, the social, social constructivist misrepresentation of technological determinism. So I say, um, do social constructivists say that it is the available technology that determines worker skills rather than worker skills influencing the application of technology? Well, that, that last sentence saying that technology exists outside society capable of directly influencing skills and work organization, that does sound like exactly what's in the passage. So Let's uh, keep choice A and keep going. Uh, do the constructivists say that the determinists believe all progress in industrial technology grows out of a continuing negotiation between technological possibility and human need? Well, that, that sounds more like um, what John Clark might say, So, but that's not the misrepresentation. Um, is it C, some organizational change is caused by people, some is caused by computer chips? That actually sounds like Clark's conclusion at the very end, that uh, some things people decide and some things to, that technology decides. Um, but what Clark actually thinks is not how social constructivists misrepresent 
the position of people like him, so it's not C. Do determinists believe, according to constructivists, that most major technological advances in industry have been generated through research and development? Haha. <laughs> well, that's probably true, but we don't find out anything about how uh, technological change happens, just uh, what it does when it does happen. So that's outside the scope of the passage. Choice E. Some industrial technology eliminates jobs, but educated workers can create whole new skills, skills areas by the adaptation of the technology. Again, that's probably true, but that's not part of either of those arguments. That goes, takes us back to A. Let's just double check it. It is the available technology that determines worker skills rather than worker skills influencing the application of technology. That does really sound like that last sentence in paragraph three, that technology is capable of directly influencing skills. So we'll keep that guy, mark it as correct, and well, we are correct. I mean, that is the answer. So go, go team GMAT. Anyway, on to number 124. The information in the passage suggests that Clark believes that which of the following would be true if social constructivism had not gained widespread acceptance. So um, we find out that we, from one of the previous questions that we answered that Clark believes that views like Braverman's obscure the role that technology plays in driving managerial changes. Okay, so if social constructivism had not gained widespread acceptance, people would see his point of view more clearly that technology drives some stuff, right? That's technological determinism. So let's find that. Answer choice A, businesses would be more likely to modernize without considering the social consequences of their actions. Uh, well, um, yeah, actually, what businesses will actually do doesn't really appear to be uh, the focus of the passage at all. It's more just about who's driving whom rather than what businesses will actually do um, in response to either of these theories. So, you know, no, not A. Uh, B, there would be greater understanding of the role played by technology in producing so social change. So the fact that technology produces social change, possibly a decent example of that actually would be that some of you are actually learning on Grokit right now, as opposed to in a classroom or from a real life tutor. Um, anyway, uh, yes, so that sounds like what uh, Clark would believe, that um, people would be more willing to, to look at how technology drives things as opposed to the other way around. We'll keep that. Uh, C, businesses would be less likely to understand the attitudes of employees affected by modernization. Again, what businesses do and how employees react is kind of outside the scope here. Not C, certainly not what Clark has talked about. Um, D, modernization would have occurred at a slower rate. The rate of modernization is not a factor. Um, and E, technology would have played a greater part in determining the role of business in society. So this one is kind of tempting at first, but really what Clark is saying is not that technology decides the role of business, it's more that technology decides how business is structured. So, um, if anything. So, because business is probably going to be there no matter what. So, um, I think we can safely eliminate E, and that takes us back to B, that there would be greater understanding of the role played by technology in producing, in producing social change, as opposed to society producing technological change. Enter choice B. Not done erasing. There we go. Question number 125, last column on this page. So according to the passage, constructivists employed which of the following to promote their argument? Where do we find out about the promotion of their argument? That's paragraph 3. It actually says the constructivists gain acceptance by misrepresenting technological determinism. So we want something that says that they are filthy liars. I'm exaggerating, that they are filthy exaggerators, or, uh, wait, filthy misrepresenters. Anyway, choice A. Um, do, they, they, do they promote their argument A, with em empirical studies of business situations involving technological change? So that's actually something that happens in the passage. That's what Clark does, though, 
not what the social constructivists do. So that's actually Clark. Um, do they employ citation of managers supportive of their position? Nobody does that. So it's not B. Uh, C, construction of hypothetical situations that support their view. Nope. Um, uh, D, do they employ contrasts of their view with a misstatement of an opposing view? That does sound like misrepresentation of technological de determinism, a misstatement of it. Uh, and then E, descriptions of the breadth of impact of technological change. Uh, no, I mean, it sounds like both parties deal with that, and it's definitely not what allowed them to gain wide acceptance. So that leaves us with D. Um, they used contrasts of their view with a misstatement of the opposing view, namely technological determinism. Number 126. The author of the passage uses the expression are supposed to in line 27 primarily in order to do what? Whenever we get one like this, we do need to go back and reread that, um, that because we don't really get any context from the question stem itself. It's well worth our time to just go back and scan for that. So line 27, it looks like it's that first sentence of paragraph 3 where we find out about the misrepresentation of technological deter determinism. The constructivists gain acceptance by misrepresenting technological determinism. Technological determinists are supposed to believe, for example, that machinery imposes appropriate forms of order on society. So in that sense, um, again, not looking at the answer choices, technological um, determinists are supposed to believe, that's what um, social constructivists are saying that technological determinists believe. So it's the, um, the misstatement or the misrepresentation. The supposed to signals that misrepresentation. Um, so A, um, does the expression are supposed to A suggest that a contention made by constructivists regarding determinists is inaccurate? So supposed to, well, you know, we'll keep that one. Again, we're kind of trying to move through these relatively quickly. Um, is it there to define the generally accepted position of determinists regarding the implementation of technology? No, this is the misrepresentation. Uh, C, is it there to engage in speculation about the motivation of determinists? No, uh, their, their motivation isn't there. This is all just about uh, a statement about what they really say. Uh, D, is it there to lend support to a comment critical of the position of determinists? No, there's no comment <laughs> critical of the position of determinists. That's not it. And E, contrast the historical position of determinists with their position regarding the exchange modernization. Well, we don't really have, it's not like a worldwide determinists held a meeting to uh, decide what they felt about this particular phone exchange being modernized. And there's certainly no historical position of determinists mentioned either. So E is way out, which get, takes us back to A. So are supposed to, does that suggest that a contention made by uh, constructivists regarding determinists is inaccurate? So yes, um, the are supposed to is what the author is saying that constructivists are saying about what they want people to believe that determinists are saying. Whew, I know, right? So um, the, the are supposed to is the author's way of indicating that the author does not believe that or it's, it's the way that the author shows that the uh, constructivists are uh, falsely putting a belief in the in the mouths of technological determinists yeah so also by process of elimination choice a is the correct one okay last question then on various uh, isms, technological determinism, social constructivism, exchange modernizations, and stuff. Okay, question number 127. Which of the following statements about Clark's study of the telephone exchange can be inferred from information in the passage? 
So where do we find out about Clark's study? Uh, that was in paragraph four, where we really find out what uh, he looked at in his analysis. So um, rather than go back and read that whole thing, it's probably the longest paragraph in the passage. Let's just look for things and then see if we can find support for that. Because only one of these answer choices will have direct support in that paragraph. Um, so choice A, um, can we infer that Clark's reason for undertaking the study was to undermine Braverman's analysis of the function of technology? So that's kind of tempting because uh, we do find out that uh, Clark refutes the extremes of the constructivists by both theoretical and empirical arguments. However, uh, later in that same paragraph, we do find out that some changes Clark attributes to the particular way management and labor unions negotiated the introduction of the technology, whereas others are seen as arising from the capabilities and the nature of the technology itself, which suggests that Clark is not completely dismissing the idea that society plays a role in determining technological change, just that uh, social constructivists uh, tend to ignore the technological deterministic side of it. So it's not there to undermine Braverman's analysis. Um, it's more to present a uh, more well-rounded picture of what's going on, not A. Um, can we infer that Clark's study suggests that the implementation of technology should be discussed in the context of conflict between labor and management? No. Uh, labor and management and, and the kind of conflict between them, that's really more what Braverman is doing, not what Clark is doing. Uh, C, can we infer um, that Clark examined the impact of changes in the technology of switching um, at the exchange in terms of overall operations and organization? There was that sentence that we read before. Um, um, yeah, switching, switching systems altered work, and this is line uh, 44 and onward, switching systems altered work tasks, skills, training opportunities, administration, and organization of workers. So that is overall operations and organization, so that's pretty tempting. We'll make kind of a crooked smiley, uh, crooked smiley check mark. Let's check the other answer choices, though. Um, choice D, Clark concluded that the implementation of new switching technology was equally beneficial to management and labor. Um, benefit has never really been um, a question for Clark. It's more just what actually happens, not D. And E, can we infer that Clark's analysis of the change in switching systems applies only narrowly to the situation at the particular exchange that he studied? Wait, Clark's analysis of the change in switching systems applies only narrowly to the situation at the... So what that's saying is that his analysis really didn't analyze very... I don't know, Choi, that's, that's nonsense. Anyway, the whole point actually is that uh, Clark's uh, analysis of the change um, applied you know, to the whole thing since it affected so many different aspects of the organization. Can't possibly be E. So that takes us back to C, the one that looked good originally, and we can mark it with confidence saying yes, it uh, did examine the impact in terms of overall operations and organization. So we'll stop there. Um, I will be taking the next four days off I know that's terrible. Um, you will have to do some, do something else uh, with your time this time of day, the next um, next four days. But I will be back on Monday, uh, Monday morning, and we will finish up reading comprehension at that point. We will pick up on page four hundred four and do the passages on page four hundred four and four hundred six, and then we will close the chapter on um, reading comprehension. So, um, again, thank you for joining me slash us. I guess us because I'm partially representing Grokit in this case. You've been watching this on Grokit.com. This is the OG TV, and we're using the 12th edition of the guide. My name is Jim Jacobson, and um, hope to see you next time.